Foss mentioned the Thank you. Uh, how many Michigan faculty can we get here? Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about something really very different from uh, the other talks um, in this workshop, and um, I'm going to talk about a, sort of a, I'm going to talk about a data problem. It sort of assumes that you've collected a bunch of data, whether they're you know auction data or or network data, and before you can begin to do anything. Uh, you need to do some cleaning, some repair, et cetera. Um, and so the joke title is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So this is how do you, how do you clean up your data so that you ensure that it is a metric? OK, so here's the setup of the problem. Uh, I'm going to take a matrix D, a symmetric matrix that's n by n. Uh, all the entries are non-negative. And this is said to be a metric if the entries on the diagonal are 0, and if the entries that come in triples satisfy the triangle inequality, i.e., D is a collection of data points that all satisfy properties of a metric. And um, I'm going to rewrite the idea of, ah, all these distances satisfy a triangle inequality. I'm going to rewrite them as a system of inequalities. And then you can stuff all of the conditions um, on D into a nice matrix M. And you can vectorize D, turn into a great big long vector. And you can rewrite all of these conditions as saying some nice structured matrix M times a vector form of D should be entry-wise greater than or equal to 0. OK, and so each row of M corresponds to a triangle IJK. And to say that all the distances satisfy a triangle inequality means that you've got this nice structured matrix. If you also wish to be pedantic and put in all of the conditions like the uh, distances must be greater than or equal to 0, then stack in the identity here into M as well. But you know, let's not be completely pedantic. Let's focus on the one I really care about is the triangle inequality. OK. So here's, the, here's the, the motivation, the setup of the problem. You know, we've collected data. We've worked with our social science friends, um, our colleagues. And they have told us, yes, this is real data. And you know, I'm going to derive some kind of similarity measure from this data or its location data. And it's supposed to satisfy a metric. You know, if it's location data, well, it really should satisfy a metric because uh, it's, you know, it's in space. Um, and um, uh, you know, when your data come from a metric, then all kinds of other Algorithms get much, much easier. So you can run you know, downstream all kinds of nice unsupervised machine learning algorithms, um, you know, for example, clustering. Uh, lots of approximation algorithms give better guarantees when your data come from a metric. There are applications in computer vision and in bioinformatics, like amino acid substitution matrices that are used in alignment problems. OK. so. How do we ensure that the data that our colleagues give us or the data that we collect really satisfies a metric? I mean, in particular, any time you work with real data, it's messy. It's horrible. Sensors crap out. You get noise. You know, things, things are a mess. OK, so, but you know, all of the world is set up for this beautiful situation. How do I, how do I clean things up? OK, so formally, I would like to, given a set of distances um, or you know, given a similarity matrix, I would like to ensure that the matrix that I operate on, on my downstream algorithms, I would like to ensure that that data really does come from a metric. So I'm going to assume that I'm given some corrupted metric D prime, i.e., some triangle inequality is broken. And I would like to find a perturbation p so that d prime plus p is a metric. In other words, find p such that m times d prime plus p is then greater than or equal to 0 entry-wise. OK, and if you would really insist on being pedantic, you know, you got to clean up m so that I ensure that everything in here really satisfies a, a, a proper distance. Things are non-negative. OK, so here 
I like to think D prime is the corruption of some metric D, and P is the repair. Okay, every, everybody got that? Yeah. Uh, we also want to somehow preserve uh, that this perturbation is small in some sense, so that D prime P is close to D prime. Ah, yes. yes. Okay, yes. There are lots of ways to do this. I would like to make this as small as possible, actually. So there are a whole bunch of different ways to do this. So uh, I'm going to do this in sort of revisionist history order. So uh, I started thinking about this from an old paper of uh, Brickle, Dillon, and Tropp about 2007, 2004. And they say, no, 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 let's find a perturbation that, um, you know, basically we want to take our corrupted matrix and project onto the subspace of metrics, i.e. find the new metric that is as close as possible in the Frobenius norm to the original. Okay, so in that sense, small, okay? You could ask instead to return a metric that really and truly is Euclidean. And there's a huge history in a much older <laughs> bunch of work uh, in this area, you know, extensive work on this in the psychometric literature. You know, you could view multidimensional scaling as a version of this. Find me the closest Euclidean distance matrix to my corrupted, my corrupted distance. Okay, so this is another sense in which, you know, I want to be close. Okay. You know, I don't really like these solutions though, because they preserve they perturb most of my original distances. In other words, I have to I have to touch like all of my original data to clean things up. And I don't I don't really like that. <laughs> I would prefer to take a more optimistic approach and assume that most of my original distances are correct. And actually just a few of the uh, distances are corrupted. You know, if I collect data, a few of my sensors are noisy, but all the rest of them are pretty good. I don't want to have to, you know, this somehow feels like seriously distorting the all of the original data I collect, I want a more optimistic approach. In other words, I would like to repair as few of the original distances as possible. So that's what I mean by don't touch too many of them, have this be small. So I would like to minimize the L0 norm of my perturbation. This L0 norm, it's A, it's not a norm, and B, all it's doing is counting how many non-zero entries there are in my perturbation. In other words, how many of my original distances do I have to correct to ensure that the new distance matrix satisfies a metric? Everybody get this? Uh, this is sparse matrix repair. Make as few, sp sparse metric repair. Make as few changes as possible to ensure that your new data satisfies a metric. Okay, so, you know, if one is not looking too carefully at this slide and zooms in on this L0 norm, man, that's not a norm, it's not convex. I can't deal with this problem. Maybe I could convexify this norm and make this an L1 norm. Oh, that's, a, that's a pretty nice standard thing to do, um, except, I'm going to tell you empirically, it doesn't work as well as one would think. So the naive convex relaxation does not give you the sparsest solutions in general. Um, and then if you're really thinking combinatorially, you'll notice this matrix M, it's tall and thin, it's not short and fat, so your standard like compressed sensing machinery doesn't work. Ooh. So M is overdetermined. Furthermore, if you think about you know, where all these plus minus ones are in M, it's very structured, it's definitely not random, and it's fairly, in, it's fairly coherent. Okay, so this doesn't work very well. Yes? I think the obvious Bayesian attempt to think it through is it, uh, is this always feasible? Can you always find the perturbation? Oh, yeah, that's actually a good question. Yeah, I, yes, it's essentially you're asking for the sparsest point in a polytope, and it's a very special polytope. So um, I'm going to give you a little bit of the story ahead of time uh, about the experiments, like what one would try first, and then tell you, nah, it doesn't work so well. And then I'm going to tell you, you should really address this problem more combinatorially. OK, so I'm going to keep moving. <laughs> I, I have like 15 more minutes. OK, 
and I can talk fast. All right, so one could try reweighted L1, right? Instead of just straightforward L1, you could try a reweighted L1. It actually works incredibly well. Um, although, you know, and it is connected to finding sparse points in polytopes. So actually thinking about geometrically what it is you're doing, this is this gives you a good a good algorithm. I can't analyze it at all. Okay. Now, okay, so let's get to some technical stuff. Enough with these experiments. So the real problem with convex methods, possibly a problem, is that there are n cubed constraints that come from each of these triangle inequalities. Solving large LPs is expensive. I'd really want to exploit the combinatorial nature of this problem. I mean, come on, they're triangles. Could we possibly, this is a naive question, could we possibly efficiently detect whether or not our data is even a metric? Could we find the broken triangles quickly? Bah, probably not. Okay, so this nice result from 2010 saying the, by Williams and Williams, the following weighted problems either all have truly subcubic algorithms or none of them do. And eh, right here in the middle is checking whether or not a given matrix satisfies a metric. So we probably can't do better than n cubed time. So I'm going to give up on faster than n cubed time, but I'm not going to give up on exploring the combinatorial nature of these problems. Um, because, you know, M is so structured, it's so nice. It's, this is not a general polytope. There's something really beautiful in here. And so um, in order to exploit the combinatorial structure, I want you to think for a bit about all of the different scenarios we could have for our repairs. Let's break this problem down into pieces and see if we can tackle each piece. So the first one we're going to call decrease only metric repair. In other words, our perturbations should only shrink distances that are wrong. And so here's this triangle, one, two, seven, and the correct fix should be to shrink seven, and we get a proper triangle. We could do something else with the same triangle, one, two, seven. We could do an increase only metric repair. In other words, we, um, we constrain ourselves to only increasing distances that we think are incorrect. So change the one there to a five to make a proper, a proper triangle. Okay, and notice it's the same triangle, one, two, seven. A sparse decrease only metric repair solution is not necessarily the same as the sparse increase only metric repair solution. And furthermore, I mean, in this example, the sparsity is one for each one, but that need not be the case in more general situations. So we should consider these two situations separately, where we are allowed only to decrease, where we are allowed only to increase. And then there's the general situation where we don't, we, where we don't place any restrictions on our perturbation. One, two, seven could go to four, two, five. Okay. All right, now I claim that there's a really beautiful, simple algorithm for decrease only metric repair. And those of you who have to teach undergraduate algorithms, if you squint at this, you'll say, I've taught this. I know this. This is simply the floyd warshaw algorithm for all pairs shortest path. This fixes the distances that are incorrect, and it fixes them only by when you're only allowed to shrink distances. And so in particular, you can go through this and check. Sure enough, the what is returned, d hat, the correction, is the all pair shortest path solution for the complete graph on n vertices with the weights given by the original distances. OK. Um, I'll, what time is it? I'll let you think for a second why all pair shortest paths should be the right thing to do. You know, look, when I go to fix seven, it's too big. The best thing I should do is use the shortest path between i and j, and that's three. 
OK, so you can actually prove a nice result that all pair shortest path algorithm is the same as the, uh, sorry, this problem, all pair shortest path is the same problem as decrease only metric repair. And um, this was noticed a little bit in this original paper by Brickle. They noticed that um, uh, they had an algorithm that uh, they observed was the same as the Floyd Warshall uh, solution. And they noticed you know, element-wise um, what you returned was um, no bigger than the um, all pair shortest path solution. And then what uh, my postdoc, Lila Jane, and I showed is that, in fact, actually that is the sparsest possible decrease only metric repair. And um, in fact, you can also show that it is the closest in L1 norm, which is kind of cute. A okay. beautiful combinatorial algorithm that gives you the, in fact, a well known, simple combinatorial algorithm gives you the closest repair in L1 norm, and it's also the sparsest. So it's lovely. Um, you could, if you had access to an oracle, uh, you had some idea of which sensors were flaky ahead of time, or you had some idea, some suspicion about your data. Um, you could come up with uh, an algorithm that uses oracle information that runs faster than n cubed. Um, of course, you need the oracle information. OK. Um, increase only metric repair is, f is a fascinating version of the problem. And what makes increase only metric repair different, harder from decrease only, is that you can't figure out which leg of the triangle you should fix. So in particular, if you've got dij is greater than the sum dik plus djk, you can't figure out which one of these should you increase so as to fix this inequality, make it turn the other way around. So you know either one of these could have been initially perturbed, and you can't figure out which one to pick. The, hmm? You could flip coins. You could decide only to do one. And the second I'm going to tell you, if you decide only to do one, that's not a bad algorithm. <laughs> And then I'm going to point out that if your intuition, if your inclination is to use some kind of L1 minimization, it's not so good. <laughs> because there are many possible L1 solutions, but few of them are sparse. So in particular, I have an infinite family <laughs> of solutions for just this simple, stupid little triangle. They all have a total L1 norm fix of four. And there's an infinite number of them. You know, increase 1 by x and increase 2 by 4 minus x. OK, and I, you know, the total L1 norm here is 4. I cannot distinguish you know, any of them from one another. And it's just one simple triangle. OK, so that suggests we should do something like arbitrarily always pick one of the two trying one of the two legs of the triangles that's messed up and just fix that okay so in particular here it's either this leg or this leg that I should fix let me always pick the the one here that's on the left fix that one and return that solution okay so we're going to call this increase only metric repair IOMR it's actually not too bad. So this silly idea returns a perturbation that is guaranteed, well, it's guaranteed to produce a correct solution. I guess that's good. Uh, you're guaranteed that your, that your fix, that your repair is a metric. OK, great. That's a good thing. OK. How can I possibly interpret these, these solutions? We don't know. You know. Um, we can start to formulate ideas about the sparsity of this solution. Um, so in particular, uh, my student Rishi Santalia <laughs> has kind of bad news. <laughs> um, he can cook up a gadget for every n 
he can cook up a corrupted input matrix D prime for every value of n such that the approximation ratio is roughly order n between IOMR and, um, and the optimal solution. So, you know, this is a very particular gadget. It also depends very strongly on the fact that um, IOMR fixes distances in, in a particular order. It goes in lexicographic order. And so he uses that to build his gadget. However, you know, this is a worst case guarantee. OK, so he's busy working on, uh, on uh, uh, other interpretations of IOMR. I don't want to give away too many, too many results from last week. OK. Anyway, IOMR in and of itself is a fascinating, is a fascinating setup. OK. Uh, you can also incorporate Oracle information into um, IOMR, again, if you have some idea, uh, information ahead of time as to which triangles are broken or possibly, possibly broken. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip over this, um, this algorithm. It basically uses an oracle to give upper bounds on the true value of the distances and then uses decrease only metric repair to fix those values that you that you have um, that you know to be wrong um, and uh, you can guarantee that if you have an oracle then IOMR um, has sparsity equal to the sparsity of the oracle which is kind of nice if you have a good idea of what's broken then you're not f repairing anything more than than what you thought ahead of time was broken OK, um, you can come up with a similar heuristic for the general metric repair problem. Um, I'm not going to write down, no, I'm not going to write down the algorithm. Um, I can't say anything, really, <laughs> about, about the general metric repair uh, heuristic. You know, we can, we can write down the algorithm. We can, want, we can run experiments. We don't have too much that we can say theoretically yet. Um, OK, so um, I'm giving you this talk now in the proper order of theory first and then experiments. I began by describing the experiments, a summary of the experiments ahead of time um, to motivate what we can and cannot say in theory. Now I will give you a, a proper discussion of all of the experiments and they point to um, yet more interesting theory uh, to be done. And so. Um, the last time I gave this talk was to an audience full of mathematicians who understood the problem so easily because it's so simple. And I got a zillion ideas about experiments. So I'm going to tell you ahead of time, these are, these, these are limited experiments. And I know that there are many more we could do. So we, had, uh, we focused on uh, increase only metric repair and our heuristic algorithm for the general problem. And then, you know, convex optimization methods because it's fun to compare. Um, we did not run any experiments on decrease-only metric repair because I, I didn't particularly want to test Floyd Warshall <laughs> on graphs. I thought that was a fairly well understood algorithm by now. Uh, so the kinds of metric spaces, the kinds of data that we uh, cooked up, uh, Euclidean, uh, we took you know, random points in Euclidean space and either perturbed them um, in positive and negative ways or negative only. Uh, we cooked up uh, Erdős-Rényi random graphs and took the path metric on random graphs and, you know, again, either negative or arbitrary perturbations. Um, and then uh, because we knew that all pair shortest paths Algorithms behave, behave differently on, um, on random data. We took random symmetric matrices and uh, repaired them. We fixed them, changed them into uh, uh, proper metrics. Um, I will say that if you think for a second about how to set up these experiments, you'll see, oh, you know, there's got to be some thought that goes into, you know, by how much do you perturb things? So, to, to guarantee that you, 
that you have broken triangles to fix? Uh, what kind of parameter settings should you use for your random graphs to have different kinds of graphs, to have different kinds of um, distances or diameters or you know, connectivity, if you will, on your graphs? So you know, it takes a little bit of thought even to cook up the right sort of experiments. Um, and then to evaluate our, um, our algorithms, you know, we could have done a zillion things. We just focused on the sparsity of the output and then the runtime. So that's all I'm going to show you. And I will be quick with my experiments. Um, I'm going to tell you, let me skip. This slide is about the general algorithm for the, sorry, the heuristic algorithm for the general problem. It works, mostly. OK. Um, OK, yeah, it works mostly. What's interesting is that it left a very small fraction of uh, triangles broken, so fewer than 1% broken in the end. And um, iteratively reweighted L1 does beautifully. L1 minimization less well, and the heuristics it's somewhere in between. Um, then the funny thing is, when we went to repair uh, broken triangles on erdos rainy random graphs, we actually uh, repaired fewer than were originally perturbed. In other words, we were fixing things that had not been disturbed originally, but fixing things in such a way as to ensure that we had a metric. It's kind of interesting. Here's the, here's the identity saying this is you know, if you had the exact sparsity of what was perturbed. And so we're actually fixing fewer than what was originally perturbed. Um, and I can't explain this behavior. OK, uh, here's the uh, performance for um, uniform, uniformly sampled random symmetric matrices, where you know, roughly 50% of the triangles are broken. And uh, the heuristic does really well. L1 minimization less well. Here is roughly 50%. Um, so you know, a few quick observations. The results really strongly depend on what metric it is that you start with in the first place. Um, um, the non-convex optimization methods, so using combinatorial knowledge of the problem gives you an algorithm, gives you algorithms that are hundreds of times faster, although not beating any you know, cubic barriers. Just in, in practice on problems of this size, the, the uh, convex optimization methods, which were general purpose tools, were much slower. Um, so what's next? So um, you know, my, my Rishi is, is busy working on um, studying the ins and outs of increase only metric repair. Um, I think this is kind of interesting. These lots of graph algorithms can be expressed as linear programs. You know, they turn their dual programs and they turn into efficient combinatorial algorithms. And we've proposed a bunch of combinatorial algorithms for what are essentially graph algorithms. So what is the corresponding dual program? What is the corresponding linear program? Um, and um, one application area that we're, we're working on but is not <laughs> anything to do with sort of computational social science is uh, clustering um, genomics data. Um, and then this is my, my plug that these problems and these algorithms are really different from you know, sort of a decade's worth of sparse analysis problems. And I think it's worth having that mindset, but it's worth keeping an, an open mind when it comes to new problems. OK, thank you. There are questions. Ali. If you try to turn the problem into an ultrametric repair, does it become easier or harder? I don't know. We haven't tried that. I don't know. Eric. The ILR algorithm, can you please improve the approximation ratio? Um, I'm almost certain that you can. I've asked Rishi to do that, and he's in the, that, that is, of course, one of the things I asked him first. So he's, he's working on it, almost certainly. 
But I, I can't tell you how much better. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it at scale, you're not going to have the full matrix anyway. You're going to have a maybe a random sample, maybe yes. just a worst case sample, and 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 now you want to do everything that you did, but but saying that that's just a sample um, piece of of. of uh, Yes. I have also asked Rishi that. <laughs> uh, so like I said, he's in the middle of working on this stuff. I said, ah, what if you view increase only metric repair as um, you know, those zeros are missing data? How well does it do to fill them in? How well does IOMR do to fill them in? And, and to do the comparison with, um, there's a body of literature called matrix completion. So do the comparison. The question I ask is, is about the incorrectness in the data you do have, not in the missing data. Ah, ah, okay, we haven't done that yet. Uh, right, so you're saying what if I, uh, not only do I have missing data, but I also have incorrect data, yeah, we have. A network structure in effect that I'm willing to take the samples on, I'm gonna think about the things I don't know about, they're gonna be matrix completion, but, but even so, given that it's viewed as being sampled from the full, so it's not just a full matrix completion problem, not a real. Yeah, so, so we haven't done that. I mean, you notice I said I was, I was up front. The evaluation metrics that we've used for the experiments we've done thus far are just these two, not how, by how much did we correct things that were, you know, by, by how much in value. We just looked at how many things did we fix. So no. the answer is no, we haven't done that yet. <laughs> We did that. Oh, gee. Projecting this is low dimensional substrates, the way of projecting this, as long as you have to isomorphic, and the metrics are sort of a Um. So I'm I'm not sure. Um. I mean, I'm not sure what you're asking me. So there are these two. There are these two very uh, traditional methods. For detecting which entries are off. Uh, no, these just fix, not for doing detection. So the Williams and Williams result says detecting is just as hard as all pair shortest path. So maybe you can do detection, you know, in a probabilistic sense, but if you want it exact. Why not? I don't know. We actually kind of punted on the detection part <laughs> Th thus far. Okay. Are there any, any more questions? Okay. That's right. it for Thank you.